Welcome to the DJE Podcast, where you will learn about real estate investing from real life examples. Here's your host, Devin Elder. Okay, on the show today, we have Brian T. Bradley. He's an asset protection, uh, asset protection attorney for real estate investors. I'm going to take it from the top. On the show today, we have Brian T. Bradley. He's an asset protection attorney for real estate investors, high-risk professionals, and high-net-worth families. Brian was selected to the Lawyers of Distinction list in 2019, Super Lawyers Rising Star list in 2015, and nominated to America's Top 100 High Stakes Litigators list. He also writes on higher-level asset protection for the Oregon State Bar Law Journal. Without any further ado, Brian, welcome. How are you? Hey, thanks, Devin. I'm great. And thanks for having me on and putting this podcast together. And I think we're going to really jump into a pretty cool topic, you know, a little bit deeper details than other, other people talk about. Yeah, I'm excited to learn about this. I mean, we talk about commercial investing. We talk about multifamily investing. Uh, we talk a lot about operations and acquisitions and that kind of stuff. Today's focus is going to be more on the asset protection side. And I think we're going to peel back the onion a little bit more than just talking about LLC. So I'm excited to kind of take some notes and learn here. Thanks for jumping on. Yeah, no, like I said, I appreciate it. So you guys, um, maybe a little, little background. I mean, I had a, a brief bio, but, but what brought you to, to, to law and, and what, um, you know, what was kind of your journey in, in, uh, with, with, as it pertains to real estate as well? Yeah. So the man behind, you know, the firm really was, you know, just a life of pivoting. I was an athlete, good athlete, went to college for baseball, tore up my arm and just had to figure out life and, um, decided to turn that competitiveness into, a doctorate degree, you know, and I just didn't really know what I wanted to do with it at the time. Um, but I knew I was good with philosophy and logic and I was good at talking and arguing. So my mom's like, Hey, why don't you think of law school? I was like, well, yeah, I don't know. I like business. I really am not that interested in being a lawyer. Um, and my uncle who was in the military I was kind of bouncing back around both tracks. He's like, you're young, you're going to be coming out of college, you know, 21 the military is not going anywhere. Go to law school. If you hate it, leave after a year sure. went to law school you know fell in love with it i was that one you know nerd in the classroom that would brief and handwrite every single case the whole way through and um i was working at the da's office or prosecutor's office while i was going to law school so i went to school at night worked there during the day and i was like oh my god i love this i'm doing this um got a job offer coming out of law school from the prosecutor's office and then pff, the world just like collapsed economically you know the great recession right. hit california got put on hiring freezes for like four years and i literally had to say like all right i want to be a trial lawyer there's no way i'm going to be getting a state job and doing what i want how do i do this and so i just went into a civil trial firms um the economy trickled into all those firms and they are all going upside down and i was like all right what am i going to do now you know i have to get experience and so i just the owner of the firm who let me go is a family firm. He's like, I'm married to her. That's my two kids. Um, they're married to that person. That's my best friend. You're the new guy. Love you, man. But you got to, you know, you're being yeah. cut. Yeah. Sure. And he's like, but pulled me aside. And he's like, you got that gift and just do it. You know, don't be afraid to jump out on your own. Um, and so I did. And the way I got my experience was I just went on to all these state organizations and said, I know you have no money to pay me. I need to get into court. Um, let's make a deal. You know, you just cover the cost. I'll go in and cover everybody for free. And I did that for three wow. years working for wow. free. And I got yeah. probably about as much trial experience in just that couple of years span as most attorneys with 25 years of experience, because if someone's going to go in and represent you for free, who's not going to say like, I want that, you know? Seriously. Yeah. yeah. And then, um, I moved to Michigan and I got into working with a real estate transaction firm who was being sued for not the firm, but their client for $40 million and ended up doing some really good work there on those cases. And I always liked real estate. I always liked finances and money. And I just got tired of seeing the problems coming in after the fact. And as a trial lawyer, I was like, there has to be a way to get ahead of these problems. And it just made sense to reach into asset protection. And um, I started adding asset protection into my practice just to get ahead of, you know, the problems and help clients have some peace of mind. Mm -hmm. And then I just started affiliating with the top 
three asset protection firms in the nation and use them as mentors to help guide me. So I had really good solid product, you know, for the clients that came in sure. and I just really love the work and helping clients solve problems and be avoid problems beforehand. And so what we, we do this by using different legal structures and, um, you know, for the clients that have essentially outgrown that basic LLC setup is what, you know, my practice focuses on. And really, we're just trying to keep in mind the overall goal of, you know, asset protection is about lifestyle preservation, peace of mind and change in the way predators view you. Like it's not rocket science, you know, in the, what the goal is. It's just how do we accomplish that goal? You know, clients don't want to be stressed out about their financial security. They just want financial peace of mind. And it's just a matter of where you fall on that sliding scale um, of protection combined with your investment strategies for what we can set up for you. And so what we specifically do is work with, like you said, kind of the higher net worth clients and high risk professionals who are also investing. Um, they turned essentially that $1 million net worth mark. And, you know, what we do is going to come with a little bit higher initial startup costs, generally around $25,000, $30,000. Um, but on the other side, their profile and their needs, exposure, risk, and visibility are a lot more. And so what right. you start out, you know, like wherever you start out, you know, basic LLC set up your newbie, that's not where you're going to end up. And you just need to be able to scale up protection wise as you go along. Yeah, that makes sense. So, um, you know, the LLC format's kind of familiar to a lot of folks. When you talk about high risk professionals, you're talking about high risk of, of, pre, of predation, right? Like, uh, uh, or, or lawsuit propensity. Correct. You know, so it'd be like something like that. Yeah, like doctors, CPAs, dentists, um, they're making more money. They have a higher risk of being sued just from their profession. Plus, sure. they're making more money. So they're also investing real estate investors, especially after you get, you know, well, generally, like you buy your first property, you're going to make a lot of errors. So you had a high risk right there of getting <laughs> sued because you have a learning curve. But then as you get past that learning curve, then you have more and more, you know, properties and units, and then you're syndicating deals, maybe or investing in syndications. So now you're going to be able to you're, you're getting be opening yourself up from lawsuits and liability from, from all around you. Yep. Yep. That makes sense. So you mentioned kind of the uh, accredited investors, uh, you know, territory or $1 million net worth is kind of a threshold for starting to look at some of these other options. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can elaborate on that. You know, why, why is that kind of the benchmark that you, that you look at? Because I think that is kind of ridiculous to ask someone to say, Hey, you're just starting out. Let's go create the Taj Mahal for you. Like right, that's not right. where you need to start. Um, start where you can afford and start and then, but you also need to understand if you just use an LLC for 20 properties and you stuff $20 million into that one property blows up, almost everything is, is fair game for a judgment. Sure. And so it, that's why And the 1 million mark is because you're big enough a mark or target now to where the have nots look at you and say, you have something I'm coming after you, you know, mm -hmm. Um, but that one lawsuit, you're still small enough to where it is going to completely wipe you out. Right. And so that 1 million to 2.5 million net worth is a dangerous place to be in because you're used to developing everything yourself. You're still used to penny pinching. Um, you don't see yourself as a big enough mark, but everybody else sees you as a mark. And right. that one expected lawsuit of neg you know, negligence or malfeasance or, you know, you let your car, you know, rent your, you let, let your car to somebody and they T-bone somebody. And now you have a big massive lawsuit staring down your face that you didn't expect that lawsuit just completely destroyed everything you've worked for. And you're not going to recover from that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's quite the picture to paint there, but that makes sense. So what are some of the things that you guys start to explore? We talked about LLC protection, you know, you, you, you buy a, you might buy your first single family rental home in your own name, but at some point you're going to want to put those in an LLC. And then yeah. now we're talking about kind of the step beyond that. What are some of the tools and vehicles, I guess, for asset protection that you guys start to, to look at? Yeah. So then, you know, I would say the first thing that people need to realize first is just the difference between um, legal. So I'm trying to figure out the best way to describe this would be, practical authority versus legal authority. And so legal authority really is if everything were to work through sunshine and rainbows and judges didn't just be able to do whatever they wanted to do, then legal authority judges would follow the law, how it was written um, every single time. 
But unfortunately, that's not how the world practically works. And so judges have what's called practical authority, and that's their true power that a judge actually has to make decisions. And a judge has very broad powers to reach your assets, like seizing them, placing liens on them, foreclosures, sheriff sales, or you know, clearing title to have a clean sale or wage garnishments. And the problem is judges, even without legal authority, do these things by exercising this practical authority, even if it's in direct contradiction to established law. Um, and this is what we're trying to combat is a, a rogue judge, like especially if you're in California or some of these states where they're just money grubbing, coming after your assets, they don't like anything that's created out of state. And they're going to call it an alter ego or pierce it or just completely disregard it or they're trying to fix wrongs of the past. What do you do when that comes to, when you're staring down that barrel of a gun? So the issue, an LLC is not going to stop that. A series LLC is not going to stop that. Um, what you need to do is take away that authority over the, your assets. And what we do is take that piece of the pie away by using asset protection trust in really strong jurisdictions. And then if you are in that situation where we got a rogue situation or just a judge that's, you know, a, a piercing the corporate bail situation. Now we have really strong authority to where we say, we don't care what your judgment is. And I'm going to explain why we don't care now. And so what we're going to talk about here is the jurisdiction and asset protection trust. Mm -hmm. And these are the really the big guns that we move into once we're out of the LLC stage. And what jurisdiction means is that the laws and rules that govern you and trust and business entities are different from one jurisdiction to another and one state to another and one country to another. And so you have two options when you set up asset protection trust. You can create them domestically in the U.S. or you can set them up offshores in another country like the Cook Islands, which I'm sure most people have heard about the Cook Islands. Um, they're the one that created asset protection trust in the 80s and they're still the golden standard. I prefer the power of going offshore if and when it's ever needed, but it's not always for everybody. But I prefer the Cook Islands because it's the best home court advantage that you can ever have. It makes lawsuits go away very fast or they quickly resolve them for pennies on the dollar, even against super creditors like the IRS and the SEC, you know, like the government who can print money and come after you. Right. And so the power of foreign offshore um, asset protection trusts, like in the Cook Islands, is that they have what's called statutory non-recognition of any other countries or jurisdictional court orders. And so what this means is that a U.S. judgment is completely worthless in the Cook Islands. The offshore trustee is just going to tell the creditor, we don't care, go pound sand. Um, the person that's suing you actually would have to start their case all over from scratch in the Cook Islands, and they would be facing the highest legal standard in the world called the murder standard, which is beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, the plaintiffs have to front all the court costs and they have to fly in a judge from New Zealand. You can't bring in your US um, based attorney. So you, there's another you know, workaround that they're gonna have to find a way through. Um, and if they lose, they pay and they pay all your legal fees also. And so when you're working with the burden of proof, you know, murder standard, they're most likely going to lose and then they're going to be paying your legal fee. And the statute of limitations there is only one year. So by the time they even realize like, hey, we got to sue this guy there in the Cook Islands, they already missed their chance to swing at the ball. It's already gone by. But there's pros and cons to everything, just like with LLCs. Um, to be purely foreign, you know, offshore is going to be effective as heck. I mean, five out of five stars, statutory non-recognition, right? right? But on the other three factors, control, cost, and compliance that you're looking at, it's going to fall short because to be purely foreign, you have to be out of control and subject to the foreign trustee. Uh, your annual maintenance costs are going to be really high. You're talking about $5,000 to $10,000 a year just to keep it in compliance. And then to be purely foreign, you have a lot of IRS reporting and disclosure that you have to make, like 3520As and 3520s. And so for most people, that's really overkill. You don't need it. We only have about 5% of our clients that go into that. And so we have another component of domestic asset protection trust. You don't have to go foreign. There's a domestic component of this. Um, the benefit of these domestic asset protection trusts is they're less expensive to, with cost and maintenance fees, generally around $2,000. Um, but they fail on effectiveness and control. And the reason that the domestic asset protection trusts fail is because of just the foundation of asset protection itself. 
Um, the foundation is to not recognize another jurisdictional court orders. You don't want to be subject to the judge telling you what to do and seizing your property. You want to be able to say, hey, we don't care. Go pound sand. Let's make a deal. That's mm -hmm. one penny on the dollar. Um, but the hallmark or staple of our legal system in the U.S. is the Constitution, and we have the full faith and credit clause, meaning every state has to give full faith and credit to every other state's court orders. So if you're a California resident, you can't run from another state's judgment, you know. Um, it's just the weakness of this, you know, the system in the sense of uh, damages. And we're also starting to see a pattern of these purely domestic asset protection trusts like Nevada Asset Protection Trust or Alaska Asset Protection Trust being pierced. Um, we have a bunch of cases like In Ray Hubbard, Dell versus Dell, Tony One versus Wacker. And we have a California case, Kilker versus Steelman, where a California resident used a Nevada Asset Protection Trust. And the court just said, we don't care. You're not a Nevada resident. We don't have these in California. We're not recognizing it. And so we're, you know, we're going to bring your assets back for a judge to, you know, judgment to collect on it. Sure. Wow. Yeah. And so you're looking at the overall landscape and you're saying, okay, I outgrew these LLCs. I need to do something. There's foreign power strength, but it's expensive. There's the domestic, but they're getting weaker, you know, <coughs> excuse me. So what do you do? Which do you pick? Um, and I would say neither because we have and use what's called a bridge trust that's been created 30 years ago. And what it is is a hybrid. It's combining the best of the domestic and the best of the foreign asset protection trust. And you're just using the best of both worlds. And so um, what we use the word bridge because it just demonstrates how you're using a foreign trust and another, you know, the domestic trust and connecting them with a the bridge. And then we just slide to the safety of the Cook Islands if and when you're ever under attack. And when, you are, when the attack's over, the assets slide back to the U.S. portion of the, of the trust. And so for your CPAs and the lawyer listeners out there, or people who like to geek out and like, all right, how does this actually work? The Bridge Trust is an irrevocable tax-neutral grantor trust. And why you want the trust to be irrevocable is that um, if you're ever challenged in court, because it all comes down to what happens in court, right? So if you're in front of a judge and the judge says, hey, I see you have assets. We think you have control over these assets and we want you to bring them back to be collected on. At that point, you wouldn't have the power to actually do that. So you can tell the judge, sorry, I can't. And the judge can't hold you in contempt of court and force you to. And so that's the power of that portion of it. And what a grantor trust means is that you are the, you know, the person who created the trust actually retains some of the powers over the assets that are in them. And then like all asset protection trusts, it's self-settled, it's a spendthrift trust. And what this means is created by you for yourself as your own beneficiary. Mm -hmm. So the win-win of all of this is that for, you know, your IRS reporting taxes and disclosures, the bridge trust is going to be considered domestic and not foreign because we stay in compliance with USC section 7701. And that's called the court testament control test. And we care about this is because your IRS filings, when your domestic trust classification, or you know, like when your trust is classified domestically, you don't have to disclose everything that's inside that trust. So it gives you that anonymity and protection that you're also looking for. So you have the ease and cost efficientness of a domestic trust with the power and strength of the Cook Islands in your back pocket, if and when you ever would need it. And so how all this actually would come together is like this. The first stop on the road, you have your LLC, and then that holds your real estate and your other assets that can hurt somebody, or, you know, it has a key, it can go boom. You know, they're, they're more high risk assets. You put those into your LLCs. The next stop, you have an asset management limited partnership, and these act as a holding company and it holds the bulk of all your assets. It, you know, you put your LLCs into the holding company and then separately you can put in non-dangerous assets like cash, stock, bonds, receivables, syndication deals you know, whatever's not going to go boom and hurt somebody. Mm -hmm. The LLCs will be held inside that AMLP and we use asset management limited partnerships because they have a separation between managing partners called general partners and minority partner shares. And so you, the client would be the general partner of that LP. And this gives you the control of the assets in the holding company to invest how you want use them how However you want, you know, you still can use your, you know, have your normal life, how you're living your life. The final stop though, is the asset protection bridge trust. And it's going to be the minority limited partner of that AMLP, 
but that's the controlling interest. That's the ownership interest. So your bridge trust actually owns that AMLP. And so this is that separation of ownership from use and enjoyment. You know, the, the bridge trust, the power, the strength of the Cook Islands owns all the assets in the AMLP. You get to use and enjoy them and that's your separation. And then either you die, hopefully later on when you're like 110 and your assets get distributed per your living trust or there's a crisis, you're sued, something bad happens, the bridge trust is triggered, the assets cross the bridge to the Cook Islands and they're protected until we can settle the case, make it go away. Um, and that's the power and strength of these higher forms of asset protection. Great. Love it. Thank you for the overview on that. So I think you spelled out pretty clearly what assets can go in there. You mentioned a few, you know, uh, LP equity and syndications, things like that. Is there, is there a, is it, is it cash as well? I mean, what other assets are going in? Yeah. I mean, you're putting it, you're putting all of your um, ownership interests into LLCs and business entities in there. You're putting everything into there. Um, your 401ks, generally you don't need to um, because they have their own exemption protection. It's just a matter of if you had to ever start rolling out that money out of your 401ks, then there's things that we can do to set that up with the bridge trust to protect the rollout. Got it. Got it. And then what does this do? What, let's say you, somebody goes through and they get all of this set up for their, for all their affairs, right? They've got some cash, they've got some single family rentals, they've got some LP equity and various deals, mm -hmm. et cetera. Does it hinder the ability to, to kind of manage that on an ongoing basis? I mean, you might be kind of, you know, going full cycle on deals, exiting deals, buying new deals. How, how does it impact the ability to just kind of continue doing business, right? It doesn't at all. It's more streamlined. You know, like you're actually, one of the issues if you have, you know, six LLCs and you're filing all of your, you know, individual um, tax filings on that, that costs a lot of money and time for each one. As you start, you know, adding these new caveat, you know, the asset management limited partnership into it, you're just filing one tax return. It's a tax neutral grantor trust. So you're not filing anything additional on that. All the IRS sees is it's a grantor trust. Great. Okay. And so it doesn't hinder your ability to continue your investing. Um, it's actually more streamlined. Uh, it has a higher, obviously, initial startup cost because of the protection elements that all have to be maintained. But when you're looking at the comparison of, I have $2 million and you're telling me I can protect that ironcladly for $29,000. Okay. You know, it's like you're spending $29,000 to protect $2 million plus. That's then right. going to start growing substantially higher. And so that's where the cost analysis is. Upfront cost versus I'm going to penny pitch and be a dollar wise penny, you know, is it penny wise, dollar stupid, you know, and right. risk or level protection with higher um, assets at risk. And then say, shoot, I had a really expensive learning experience. I should have gone the other route. Um, sure. Yeah. Ounce of prevention. What um, you mentioned a, a piece that kind of piqued my interest about sliding the assets over over to the Cook Islands temporarily during kind of a storm, and then and then bringing it back. That, that's that's interesting. How does that? That's all done through um, through the bridge trust, and you're able to correct. Just, yeah, you would just work? yeah. So because the trust is it's just one trust, and so it's both a domestic trust, and then you create at the same time, the foreign trust, and it's just one trust called the bridge trust. It'd be like one, two, three, whatever um, you would name it, hopefully not your own name. Um, all the assets at that one time transfer into the trust. And so that's when the transfer of ownership automatically goes in. And then you automatically, at the same time of creating it, we have the offshore trustee in place who have a copy of the trust. They've already done their due diligence on you. It's not after the fact. And so because this is both it's classified both domestic and offshore, once the triggering events in the trust or you know, like a lawsuit um, are triggered and we decide to you know, exercise the foreign offshore portion of it, then that foreign offshore trustee takes over. And so what they're gonna end up doing is saying, all right, this is a legitimate threat. We're gonna remove you as the trustee and now the offshore trustee is gonna take over during that time. And that you want that to happen because you don't want a judge to be able to say, you're still in control. I need you to bring these assets back. You need to be able to have that foreign trustee say no, because this is duress and we're not going to comply with that. And there's nothing you can do to force us. And that's, you know, how the, um, 
sliding scale works on that is just when these predetermined triggering events happen, it just naturally slides over because the assets are all already transferred into that trust. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. So you mentioned uh, earlier here in the podcast about some of the U.S. jurisdictions maybe getting a little bit weaker, some case law that that maybe makes it not as advantageous to be purely domestically based. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, you know, these things may may change over time, but is this structure here in terms of being future proof? I mean, is this something that somebody can go through and set up now and have a reasonable degree of certainty that this structure is is going to maintain its benefits down the line, right? Five, 10, 20 years. Yeah. So, and, and that's a really good question. And I would say as of right now, absolutely, because it's the only structure. So these asset protection trusts were created in the early eighties in the Cook Islands. Mm-hmm. And it's the only thing that's been able to withstand constant attacks over 40 plus years. And it's the only thing to where we've had cases. This is a, a, I'll just go over. I use these as teaching points for uh, right. legal seminars that we use. Do not do what these guys did because um, these I use as extreme examples of how powerful these are and they still were upheld. There's the Anderson case, which is a really famous case. There's the U.S. versus Grant case. Um, and these trusts um, in both cases were set up for criminal activity, Ponzi schemes. Um, and one of them, the Grant, I think it was the Grant case, the husband set up, you know, these cases, you know, the, the offshore trust stiffed the government for like $36 million and then died. And then the government, so the man, the IRS, the SEC, you know, came after both of them, both families, the separate cases, but same kind of fact pattern. So I'm going to talk about them in general, um, came after them in the Cook Islands. And the Cook Islands were like, hey, sorry, we understand these were set up for criminal activity, but, you know, don't hold it against us, but we have to follow our statutory and constitutional guidelines. You're not getting anything. The money's safe and it's staying here. Sorry there's nothing you can do about it. And with the grants, the, I, the government came after the wife for that missed $36 million three times and failed three times. Wow. And no one has the same ability and resources and money as the government to come after you there and lose three times. And so that's how, wow. that's why these are the golden standard worldwide is, um, they're unpenetrable still. And the U S does, you know, they've tried to get access to the assets and they can't. That's a pretty interesting case study. Obviously, nothing you know any of us want to emulate. But you've yeah. got you've got the U.S. government in pursuit. You've got fraud, and you've got a large amount of money, and it, it's still held up. Correct. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. And it's just the way that the Cook Islands created the system, and then we implemented it ten years later. You know, starting in Alaska, and now have seventeen states that have some sort of asset protection um, trust. But the issue is not everybody lives in those states. And so now when you have other states competing um, for asset protection strength or not, um, states like California are just saying, we don't care. You're not a resident of those states. Why are we going to adhere to them? And that was, you know, 2012, Stilker versus Kilkman. Right. So um, once somebody gets this set up, let's say you've got a $2 million net worth with, you know, some, some cash, some equity and some deals, various real estate holdings, et cetera, you get this uh, whole mechanism in place. And then what is that scaling that, you know, portfolio over the next 10 years look like? Let's say I want to invest in one more real estate syndication with $100,000, just to get to a very specific example, right? I've got this um, trust set up. And then I'm going to go do, you know, one more deal next year. Uh, Mm -hmm. Mechanically, how does that work? Yeah. So you would still be able to invest however you want. You would own your, are you hosting the, are you, are you just passively investing? Let's say I'm a, I'm a limited partner or or I'm buying some class A shares in somebody else's syndication. Okay. Yeah. So then you would just take your share ownership and place them into the asset management limited partnership. And that would be the holding company of that. Um, if you were to be the one hosting it, then you would have, we would have you create a separate LLC and put it into that and then put that LLC into the holding company. But if you're just passively investing into the syndications, you just transfer your ownership shares into the management company. And then because the bridge trust owns the AMLP, you now have your ownership shares protected into that, you know, into there. And can you fund the, the bridge trust with, with cash? Let's say you've got, uh, you know, you've got, 
W two income or you know how how do you get funds? Well, it's just a, it's just a trust. You're not funding anything. It's just a trust that holds your ownership shares or your titles and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it'd be Got the it. same. So it's, just yeah, it's, it's just like a land trust or uh, irrevocable living trust, but it actually protects you. Got it. Got it. Okay. Perfect. So. so Sounds like you've got some consolidation of your, your tax filings every year, hopefully, right? Yeah. And some, some reduction of complexity there. And then obviously the asset protection is kind of the primary benefit here, but it seems like it's pretty easy to maintain moving forward um, with additional- It is, and all, you would, like all you would tell, yeah, all we tell the CPAs mm -hmm. is it's just passive tax through. You know, so, and that's all your CPAs want to know is how are you taxed? Well, this is tax neutral, passive tax through. And like, okay, great. And um, there's nothing extra that your CPA has to do. Um, the K-1s go through the AMLP. So you're generally just filing, you know, what is it, IRS uh, 1065, I think, you know, tax filing with one K-1. And it's pretty simple for your CPA. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. I, I, like, the, I like the consolidation and the simplicity of it. So what about, uh, you mentioned the, the <clears throat> domestic uh, options have some flaws, the, the purely... Um, uh, uh, international or, or outside the U.S. options have some flaws. What about kind of ongoing maintenance costs once everything's uh, set up? I guess ongoing maintenance costs, but also ongoing maintenance responsibilities, right? Of let's yes. say the person that's it's set up for. Yeah. So if you're just purely foreign, it's going to cost a lot. You know, five thousand, ten thousand dollars, and then you also have additional IRS tax filings, and that's where it doesn't get really simple, and then it starts creating not a mess, but like if your hair is on fire and you're still already staring down a barrel of a gun and you're like, man, I just need it. I mean, that's when we put you purely for it. Um, it but most people aren't, don't need that kind of level of protection. And um, so the bridge trust hybrid domestic foreign portion of it, it's the, the maintenance cost is $2,100. Um, us personally, I don't charge an hourly rate off of that. It's just, this is what we charge you. And, um, that goes into your yearly compliance and making sure everything's up to date as well as, Hey, Brian, this is what we're doing. Like, you know, like I need you on the phone or I'm confused. Um, it just goes into access to the team. Got it. Yep. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. And, um, and then you'll have less, you know, if you're using LLCs, you know, you're going to have a lower level, you know, cheaper, um, maintenance costs in your tax filings, you know, in franchise tax, California, $800 per LLC. So, I mean, you're paying a lot for less at the end of the day, like $800 per LLC franchise tax plus your, you know, CPA fee plus your CPA, you know, filing. So you're actually getting up there um, for less protection. Like when you actually start breaking down the numbers. Yeah. Especially as the LLC number creeps up, right? You start to get mm -hmm. a, a number of different LLCs, number of different bank accounts. Yeah, that. because if you're so, using LLCs, you don't want to stuff everything into one LLC, like we said before. You know, like if one asset blows up, you know, generally the rule of thumb is two assets per LLC or, you know, a million dollars or less. Um, right, you know, right. well, yeah. But then as you start growing, if that's your plan, you know, that's just going to get, I know some clients who have, they call like 15 LLCs and like, okay, you're just a, and they call it like, I'm a CPA mess. Like, please help. Right. Yeah. Right. Which is what, you know, if you're growing your assets and you've got different real estate interests, you're, you're, you're going to stack up those LLCs. That's going to happen. Yeah. And then it's just a matter of, all right, how do we manage this better? AMLP. And then, all right, now I'm concerned about not losing anything because of my visibility and my perfect, my day job. I have high, you know, visibility on um, my investing. I'm, you know, a mark there. Then the next thing is like, okay, I want to, I want to keep what I got. What do I do? Bridge trust. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Love it. That's a great overview. Uh, how, how about resources? You know, so this may be kind of new information for some folks. This is a little bit different um, kind of topic than we talk about multifamily investing. How about resources for folks that, that want to kind of dig a little bit deeper on this and maybe geek out some more on this stuff? Yeah. I mean, they can always jump on my website, www.btblegal.com. I have a lot of um, educational information and videos on there. Uh, there's another good website, um, Asset Protection Council, that I'm a member of, and there's a lot of good um, free legal resources and education um, on that and breakdowns. They break down a lot of case law and um, articles on there. And those are, some, those are some great resources there. Yeah, perfect. Well, we will link to your website in the show notes. If somebody wants to reach out, Brian, I imagine they can kind of hit the website and find, uh, find a way to get in touch there. 
Yeah, hit the website or email me, Brian, B-R-I-A-N at btblegal.com, you know, my website. And we do free consultations and I used to charge for them, but I just, I'd rather have people call in and say, hey, this is what I'm thinking. This is, you know, I don't know what to do. There's so much information out there. Or I'm uh, talking Mm -hmm. to attorney salesman who is all sunshine and rainbows and I'm just confused now. Um, And I would rather people call and not be afraid to not talk to a lawyer because of the consultation fee and not go anywhere. Right. So just call, you know, ask me your questions. Let's just be efficient with time. So have your stuff ready to rock and roll. Um, and we'll go through the pros and cons of whatever it is that you're in, what your full financial makeup looks like, your risk profile looks like and lay out. Maybe you are at the starting scale. Maybe you're in the middle. We don't know, but, um, you just, just call and get a free consultation and take that and go to other firms and see what other firms have to say. Yeah, that's great. Well, listen, that's a good offer. Good, good resources there. And this is really helpful for me. I've got some great notes here from, from this. And I think our listeners will take some value away from this too. So Brian, thank you very much for your time today. Yeah, no, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. I hope that, you know, your listeners probably listen to this a couple of times because there's a lot of, you know, deep information into it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Very valuable. And um, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks. All right. Thank you for listening to the DJE podcast. For more information, please go to djetexas.com.